those who are streaming online. I've entitled my sermon today as Seeking a Sign. And thank you for the scripture that was read. Um, serves as a basis, not really a text that we're going to analyse, but as a basis of the sermon that I'm going to deliver today. A number of years ago, while I was still back in South Africa, um, one of the colleagues I worked with um, she used to go to church with her, with her boyfriend in the church. She went to as a, like a charismatic Pentecostal type church. Uh, and they had a number of healing campaigns that went on and those generally spanned a number of uh, weeks uh, in the campaign, depending how long the campaign was. And uh, they used to go to church there. And then, anyway, the one particular time they went to church and there was no healing campaign because well, it had come to an end. And so it was just, I suppose, a regular kind of a, a worship service that they would have. And then after that, I overheard a conversation between them um, that went something like this. Um, and she said to him, well, are we, are, we going to, um, are we going to church this Sunday? And uh, he said, no, I don't want to go to church this Sunday. They don't, they don't have the healing campaign on anymore. And so she said to him, well, they can't have a healing campaign on every week. And so he said, well, if there's no exciting healing campaign on, what's the point of going? And I thought that was a very interesting um, conversation that they had there. And it's kind of like an indicative of what a lot of people, especially young people, have in terms of what they look for. Uh, when they go to church. Obviously, it's exciting when you go to a healing campaign. I use healing campaign in inverted commas. Um, but what is it that they're going to church for? And obviously, they'd gone to church to be able to see and feel that excitement that goes on during a, a healing campaign. Um, why do people like to see signs or see some kind of indicators, exciting powerful, wow, perhaps kinds of indicators to know that uh, God is in their lives and God cares. Um, why is it they need to see these signs? I mean, I can think of a number of examples that maybe some of us are guilty of. Uh, how many of you, um, don't, don't put up your hands please, but how many of you have ever prayed for a, a parking place? You know, it's hot and it's stinking hot and uh, you have to park on the outside there and you want to go do your shopping and you pray for a parking place that you can do uh, for convenience sake, to do your, your shopping and to come back. What about uh, someone who builds their house in Tornado Alley, if you're aware of what Tornado Alley is, it's in an area, I'm not sure exactly where it is, probably in the south of the USA, where it's known for uh, a path that tornadoes follow that have got quite a lot of destructive force. Now, who, what kind of person moves into Tornado Alley and builds a house there and then prays to God that they'll protect their family and their house in that in situation, I don't know. The scripture I've got there, Matthew chapter 7 says, and uh, I think it talks there about uh, the wise man uh, who builds his house on the rock and the foolish man builds their house on the soil. If you build your house on the soil, well, it's going to get swept away by the floods, right? What about this? We go to a town where there's absolutely no employment anywhere and then we pray to God, can we have employment, please? 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10 to 13 talks about this idea of if a man does not work, he shall not eat. All right. You need to provide yourself and get a job. How many of us have prayed for God to heal somebody who has terminally ill? How many of us pray for rain and during periods of drought? 
It says here in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 45, it talks here about how God allows the sun to shine on the righteous and the unrighteous. And he also allows the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. You know, why we pray for things like that is not really relevant. Or whether God can or does answer our prayers in those scenarios is also irrelevant. What is relevant is this. If, for some reason, God does not answer the prayers or our prayers in the way that we expect, is our faith in any way negatively impacted as a result of that. God not answering our prayers. If it is negatively impacted in some way, shape or form, what does that mean? What that means is our faith is somehow dependent on these external physical signs. Is that a fair enough assumption to make? Let's have a look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 to 2. This is what it says. Now faith is the certainty of things hoped for, a proof of things not seen. For by it the people of old gained approval. I'm looking at that verse and think to myself, if we want to have any kind of evidence of our faith and how it's going, it will be in things that are not seen. All right, let's expand on that. Let's have a look. What does all that mean to us today? You know, we have a lot of ignorance um, throughout the world, um, and generally that ignorance leads to a misunderstanding or a misinterpretation of what God wants for us. I think I've mentioned this before. A lot of people don't understand the full idea of what baptism is. And as a result... Um, not knowing what it is, it's going to lead to problems and not knowing uh, the importance of it. They're not going to know um, why it's important. Other things like a lot of people have a different idea of what salvation is or in what shape or form it comes in or what you need to do to have salvation. And if you don't fully understand what salvation is, um, you're not really going to know how to pursue it. If we do not know what God's love expects from us, how is it that we can express love to each other and love to God? We don't know. If we have ignorance, how will we know what to do? If we don't understand what the Spirit is, we won't know how to interact with it. And in the same way, if we do not know what a sign is from God, how we, will we be able to recognize it when we see it? I'm not here day, today to give you bad news. We don't see signs anymore. That's not what I'm here for. Yes, we see signs, and there are plenty of signs, perhaps way more than we can even predict or understand. God shows us signs in many different ways. So the good news is that there is signs for us today, but these signs are different to what a lot of people may think. They're not these external signs that we have. And uh, when we think of the history of Israel, they did get a lot of signs from God that showed how God was for them and on their side. They were winning battles, etc. They had all these signs, these external signs, but they never seemed to be enough. Because when that generation passed away, it seems like the next generation wants to see those signs again. And so they had this dependency on all these external physical signs in their lives. No, there's a lot of internal and more spiritual signs that we can benefit from that are more longer lasting and more powerful to us as indicators of the state of our faith and the walk that we are going through, the journey that we are on towards, towards heaven. There are a lot of internal signs. If we understand how the Spirit works in our lives and how we are able to recognize 
its influence and its science, then we will indeed be blessed. This is what Jesus says in John chapter 20, verse 29. Jesus said to them, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. Very powerful scripture. And it's an indicator that the power of faith is not in what we see physically, but in what we believe and what we can see internally. And that's what we're going to have a look at today, is to try and understand these signs, to try and understand the things that happen to us that come from God that indeed indicates and shows to us that we are blessed people. He has a scripture that, um, it's one of those scriptures that you would read, and each time you read it, and this is how the word basically works, is that you might read a scripture once, uh, for the first time maybe, you're a new Christian, you read it for the first time and you get an understanding of what that verse is saying to you. And then you might, five years down the line, you might read that verse again and you might get a different understanding as you mature in Christ. As you get a better understanding of his will and his plan of salvation, you get a new understanding from that verse. And this is one of these verses um, that um, has happened to me when, when you read it more and more, you get a, a deeper understanding. What I can see in this particular verse here, and let's read it out here. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. Otherwise, believe because of the works themselves. What does this verse tell you? I see a very clear distinction in this same verse, in this one verse to two different qualities, or rather, um, perhaps qualities is not the right word, um, two different um, grades, grades of faith that are being pointed out here. So yeah, we have the first one that talks about um, believing in God because we believe in God. Don't need to see a sign. The second part is Believing in God only because we get to see some kind of evidence, we get to see some kind of wow thing happening that says, oh, well, that must be, that must be God. And of course, that's how Jesus operated initially. In the beginning, he came performing signs, performing wonders, as is well summarized in Acts chapter 2, um, when Peter was speaking there, recapping and summarizing the life of Jesus and the approach that he took. He came to perform miracles that people could see, but it was an idea that once people could see those miracles, they would then see the credentials and the qualifications, if you like, and the authority of Jesus because he performed those works. No one can perform those works unless they come from God. And then once he had established that, as time goes by, we have those miracles recorded in detail in the, in the scriptures, in the gospels, and in other places where we see those miracles occurring uh, through the apostles and the evangelists. And now they have been recorded so that now, it takes on a new medium now, now we can read about them. And then we'll know God's credentials because we read about these miracles and how they were performed. They now point to his credentials. Now we believe in him because of the words that he says. We've progressed. We've matured. I'm going to have a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I might not read the entire passage. But this is uh, well known as the passage of love. First Corinthians 13 says this, and we go from verse 8. Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. For when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away. When I was a child, I used to speak as a child. Think as a child, reason as a child, 
But when I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in the mirror dimly, but then face to face, now I know in part. But then I shall know fully, just as I also have been fully known. But now abide faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. Yeah, we introduced you a journey that we go through as God's people as a whole where there was a time when there were miracles and tongues and prophecies and all these things happening, signs that we could see with our eyes. And as we matured and went through, and the church matured and went through uh, the, the first century, it progressed to a point where we now have those greater gifts that go beyond those more external gifts. And here we're talking about faith, and faith is the first one mentioned here, and hope and love. And so as we progress and as we mature, that faith takes on a new form. Takes on a form not having to experience tongues and prophecy and all those things, but now faith that we have in the perfect word, the law of liberty. It's a process that we go through and we need to progress and as over time they progressed from a type of belief that was based on the works that Jesus performed it now is a belief that's based on the word. All right, so how do we recognize? How do we recognize these internal, these spiritual signs? If they're not going to be as obvious as uh, some kind of miracle playing out, like a, somebody moving a mountain from here to there, something very evident that can be seen with our eyes, how do we recognize these signs that are more internal, that are more spiritual? How do we identify those? How do we identify, how do we get that sign that shows us the Spirit is working in our lives? And believe me, if we don't recognize, or if we don't learn how to recognize those signs, we're doomed. We're not going to be able to benefit from those signs. We're going to lose our faith. We're going to lose our spirituality. We're going to lose our perspective on the journey that we, that we are taking. How do we recognize those signs? Now, I don't know what your situation is. If you're a person who's not a Christian and you're thinking about this idea of becoming a Christian, how do you recognize those signs? What will you be able to recognize? What, what is going to make the difference for you to go the next step? Or perhaps you're a new Christian, haven't been a Christian for very long, maybe less than one or two years. How do you recognize the signs? How do you know that your faith is on the right track? How do you know that God is in your life and he cares for you and loves you? How do you know this? And what if you're a Christian who's been going for many decades. Um, they may well have people in this audience who've been Christians for 50 years or more. A long time. How do you recognize the signs? How do you recognize that God loves you? What shape, what form, what guise does that sign take on for you? The word. Scripture is quite clear. Talks about faith, and faith is going to be what I'm going to mention a lot in this sermon because uh, faith is the main indicator, if you like, that indicates to us and shows us whether we're on the right track or not. If our faith is strong, we're on the right track. If our faith is waning and getting weak, we're moving backwards, we're heading in the wrong direction, right? Scriptures tell us here clearly. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. You have to keep in mind that back in those days when these scriptures were written, I don't think the majority of people could read. And so it talks there about hearing the message. So when we try and apply it uh, in, in today's terms, we're not just talking about hearing the message like you're hearing the message while I'm speaking, but when you read the message, because we're all able to read. Faith comes by our contact with the message, the word of God. God's word shows us what we need to do in a world 
That seems out of control. All right? There's a whole lot of instructions in there um, that are written that understand what we as Christians will be going through, and they're there to equip us to understand how to deal with um, each of those situations. Um, I like this account of the jailer. You all know the story about the jailer. Basically, the jailer is someone who was looking after Paul and his companions, and uh, they were locked in the jail there, and they, while they were in jail, they were preaching the word, and the jailers were sitting there and they were listening, listening to the words that Paul was saying, and uh, looking at how positive they were despite the situation they were in, and they were listening to that, and this led to the jailer saying something like this, what should I do to be saved? Somehow that message, those words, led to them taking that step of faith and wanting to be saved. That's what the word does, whether it's a spoken word or whether it's a word that we read out. Faith comes by hearing that message. Here's another scripture, John chapter 8. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. There's a special something that you feel when you believe in God's word, when you do the things that are written in his worth, when you, when you are truly his disciples. God says, um, if you love me, you keep my commandments, right? So that's our way of expressing love. And when we study the word and we see the truth in the word, what is it that we feel? We feel set free. And this is, a, this is, a, sorry, this is another sermon on its own, this particular verse, being set free. But when we can feel, by reading this word, when we get feelings within us, that feel like we are set free, there's a sign from God. That's an internal, internal, spiritual sign from God that we're on the right track, that our faith is headed in the right direction, in the right direction, when we feel set free because of the influence the Word has in our lives. There's our first sign for us, being set free and it's provided by the word. How else can we see the signs from God that tell us that he loves us and cares for us? How else? What about trials? Okay, this is not a misprint. Um, this is trials. Actually, trials can be used as a positive benefit to enrich our lives. So this is not a misprint here, yes. Trials can be used as a vehicle for us as a sign from God that we are on the right track. Let's have a look. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials. Some people just simply, sorry, that second part there, there's a mistake. That's not, that's not the rest of the verse. I don't know. I must have copied it somehow wrong, and it's got that string in there. So just the first part there. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials. I think this was copied from our previous sermon or something, I'm not sure. But when you can consider it joy, despite the trials that you go through, I mean, to have trials and tribulations, that's not a sign from God. That, let me be clear on that now. That's not a sign from God. What is a sign from God is that despite those trials and tribulations that we feel, we still are able as an individual, as a congregation supporting each other, we're still able to feel joy, then I tell you what, that's a sign from God. That joy is a sign from God. And in the same environment, exposed to the same trials, exposed to the same tribulations, you may be, have non-believers out there and you may see a totally different impact that those trials and tribulations have on those people. And it won't be joy. 
it'll be something very different. But because we're in the church and we're together united in a cause, when we feel that joy, it's a sign to each of us personally and as a church that God is with us and cares about us and loves us. Another sign that we have. When we feel that joy, it is an internal, internal sign from God. What else? What else happens in our lives that allows us to see that where our faith is progressing? Now again, that's not a misprint. Yes, through persecution, these things can be revealed to us as well. Now I made a, I know I can use Jesus as an example, dying on the cross, but I thought I'd use somebody um, human, if you like. If we read the story about Stephen, this is now towards the end of his discourse that he had with the, the, the Jewish Sanhedrin and leaders. And uh, after imparting all his wisdom, um, through the wisdom that was given to him through the Holy Spirit, he says this, right at the end, after he, he had spoken, they went on stoning Stephen, as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. He died. Once again, it's not a sign from God when we are persecuted. Again, let me make that clear. It's not a sign from God when we go through that kind of persecution. And we will go through that persecution today, maybe not to the extent that Stephen went through it or the martyrs did in the first century. But if we are able to feel forgiveness, and that was a, an example set to us by Jesus himself when he was dying on the cross, and something that affected and rubbed off on Stephen, he felt this forgiveness for the Jewish leaders despite what they were doing to him, stoning him to death. That feeling of forgiveness, despite persecution, that is a sign from God. That is an internal sign from God. And uh, we do hear a lot of stories about the martyrs of old. I don't have any um, scriptures or reference here of all the early historian writers back in those times, but I heard that they felt this sense of peace when they knew they were nearing their death. That is a sign from God, an internal sign from God, when you can feel that peace even in those scenarios. And hopefully we never find ourselves in those scenarios, I don't know what we'll do. I don't know what signs will come to us. I don't know how strong our faith will be. But all credit to those back then and how strong their faith was and how strong their focus was on finishing the goal despite what was happening around them and to them. Singing. I like this verse. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody with your hearts to the Lord, Ephesians chapter 5. This is quite a, a powerful verse and there's a lot of confusion nowadays when you, when you look at the denominations out there that have musical instruments that accompany uh, their, um, their songs. And there's a lot of confusion between uh, what is spiritual and what is emotional. I don't know, you, you, you all know the power of music, right? And we're talking about the music, the notes, the, the, et cetera. We're talking about the words here. There, there is a lot of power in music. And music is able to induce in us these amazing emotions um, of, or it can go either way. We can feel happiness, we can feel depression, we can feel sadness, anything, depending on what the song is is about and the melody and the notes and the instruments perhaps that are used, there's a powerful indicator. But these emotions that the music produce, the musical instruments produce in us, uh, those emotions are not to be confused with spiritual. Of course, the spirit can produce emotions, but the emotions cannot produce the spiritual. Make no mistake, 
when we are singing, if anything in that song has an impact on us other than the words of the songs themselves, then there's a problem. Because everything else is man-made. The words are from God that are used in that song. When we feel the melody, what does that mean to feel the melody in our hearts? What does that mean? I suppose that's um, the feeling that you get when you're singing as a congregation and you're listening to the words and the words are written on your heart and you, the words in some way resonate in our lives. That making melody, that feeling of melody in our hearts is a sign from God. When we can feel that as individuals and as a congregation, that is a sign from God that he is with us and he is speaking to us through his word. If we can feel the melody and not the emotion, that is a sign from God. What about good works? A couple of denominations out there don't really place much emphasis on works because um, they don't really mean anything. It's all about faith uh, alone, as a lot of the uh, denominations go. But works are very important. We'll see for that in, in a number of different ways. But someone may well say, and this is James chapter 2, someone, but someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I'll show you my faith by my works. What does that verse mean? It indicates that there's something more to works. Works are not only uh, an expression of our faith because the faith that we have obviously inspires us to perform works, right? It inspires us to do good things. It makes us want to do good things. That's what faith does. And works is a lovely means of expressing that faith that we have. But more than that, a little bit later on in that same chapter, James says this. You see that faith was working. You see, sorry, you see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. Can you see what works do? Have the potential for doing to our faith? In the same way, they can increase our faith. It's kind of like a double directional thing going on here. Faith uh, inspires us to do works and works increases our faith. They kind of like work together. Works are also a means to strengthen our faith. So what is the sign from God then in this application? It's not the fact that we do works. It's not the fact that we um, have a list of things that we need to do as part of our ministry and we tick them off as we go along. That's not what works are. That's not what we're talking about. But when we feel the willingness and the genuineness behind those works that we perform, those feelings of willingness and genuineness, those are a sign from God. How many people are out there that do good works and they do them grudgingly or they do them in order to get recognition or they do them for some other cause other than willingness and genuineness? That's not a sign from God. What is a sign is if we have those feelings in our heart. That's a sign from God that our faith is heading in the right direction. No sermon is complete without a reference to love. I think if you don't use the word love in any sermon, that's wrong. You've got to use the word love in there something. Everything is about love. And we had a look at this chapter a little earlier on, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient, love is kind. It is not jealous. Love does not brag. It is not arrogant. It does not act disgracefully. It does not seek its own benefit. It is not provoked, does not keep an account of wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It keeps 
every confidence, it believes all things, hopes all things, endure all things. He has another good indicator. He has another a scripture that's very vitally important to us because it's listing the signs that we need to look for when we express love. If we have those signs, if we have those feelings that accompany our acts of love, they are signs from God. If we show our patience, like it says in verse 4, if we show that kindness, if we are able to not be jealous or fear those horrible feelings of jealousy, all these reactions, all these attributes, if we display them, they listed for us here to help us and to show us what the signs are from God, what we should feel that shows that we have true love, that we are truly disciples of God. Look at all those ways that love can manifest itself. If we feel the love in the right way, that's a sign from God. So in conclusion, I don't know what the state of your life is if you um, are experiencing faith issues in your life. Um, something's not going right. Maybe something um, happened in your life some time ago and it has some kind of effect on you. You haven't spoken to anyone about it. You haven't spoken to God about it. And it's taking its toll on your faith. What do you do? If you're looking for a sign from God that God still loves and cares for you when you find yourself in that situation. You may be a Christian for a very short period of time or a very long period of time. If you want to know whether God loves and cares for you, don't look outwards for a sign. Look within. Thank you.